Here's a short clip of Stephen Meyer from a debate that he had with Michael Shermer in 2009. Now one more problem as far as the generation of information. It turns out that you don't only need information to build genes and proteins. It turns out to build body plans, you need higher levels of information, uh, higher, uh, higher order assembly instructions. DNA codes for the building of proteins. But proteins must be arranged into distinctive uh, uh, circuitry to form distinctive cell types. Cell types have to be arranged into tissues. Tissues have to be arranged into organs. Organs and tissues must be specifically arranged to generate whole new body plans, distinctive arrangements of those body parts. We now know that DNA alone is not responsible for those higher orders of organization. DNA codes for proteins. It, but, but by itself, it does not ensure that protein, cell types, tissues, organs will all be arranged into body plans. And what that means is that, that, the, the, um, that body plan morphogenesis, as it's called, depends upon information that is not encoded in DNA, which means you can mutate DNA indefinitely, 80 million years, 100 million years, till the cows come home, and it doesn't matter. Because in the best case, you're just going to find a new protein someplace out there in that vast combinatorial sequence space. You're not, by mutating DNA alone, going to generate the higher order structures that are necessary to building a body plan. So, so what we can conclude from that is that the neo-Darwinian mechanism is grossly inadequate to explain the origin of the information we need to build new, uh, build new genes and proteins, and it's also grossly inadequate to explain the origin of novel biological form, which is to say uh, it's not adequate. Thank you. And from page 281 of his book, Darwin Stout, Stephen Meyer states, according to neo-Darwinism, new information, form, and structure arise from natural selection acting on random mutations arising at a very low level within the biological hierarchy, within the genetic text. Yet both body plan formation during embryological development and major morphological innovation during the history of life depend upon a specificity of arrangement at a much higher level of the organization, organizational hierarchy, a level that DNA alone does not determine. This article states, but there are solid empirical grounds for arguing that changes in DNA alone cannot produce new organs or body plans. A technique called saturation mutagenesis has been used to produce every possible developed mutation in fruit flies, roundworms, and zebrafish, and the same technique is now being applied to mice. None of the evidence from these and the numerous other studies of developmental mutation supports the neo-Darwinian dogma that DNA mutations can lead to new organs or body plants because none of the observed developmental mutations benefit the organism. From the following video, Dr. Arthur Jones tells of another falsification of neo-Darwinism. Cortical inheritance. And I want to talk a little bit about that, about that because uh, I was looking at the tremendous evidence that exists that DNA is actually responsible for very little in heredity. And as Darwinism is entirely based on the assumption that DNA is the be all and end all in heredity, that's obviously an interesting point. What's but Darwinism is, is based on what I'd call genetic reductionist model of organisms. It's on the assumption that DNA is the sole carrier of information in heredity and development. And that all the characteristics of an organism are encoded in its DNA, that DNA is some kind of blueprint or, or recipe, and those are the kinds of words that are used. DNA is God and RNA and his prophet, is how my biology lecturer at Birmingham University put it, though he didn't actually believe it. And then the idea is that mutations in the DNA, base changes in the DNA at root, lead to new organisms and so explain the evolutionary descent of all living things. So clearly if you accept that DNA model, that DNA 
is responsible for coding in some way all the characteristics of an organism, whether as recipe or as blueprint, then obviously you've got the basis of a theory of evolution, a scientific theory. Changes in the DNA produces changes in the organisms, etc. Everything flows from there. Uh, and yet, an unknown secret here, that neo-Darwinian paradigm has been known to be false, unquestionably false, irrefutably false, for over 50 years. I'd say the decisive year when the evidence became overwhelming was 1954, uh, when a guy called Tracy Sonneborn published his final paper in his research after about 20 years of, of research. And it's all to do with what's often called cortical inheritance. So uh, cortex is just a name given to the, the cell membrane round cells and part of the cytoplasmic structure underneath. So it's a bit of a vague term, and probably not a terribly useful term, but, but that's what it was historically referring to. And in fact, until the 1930s, it was commonly believed by biologists that the genes do not determine the fundamental feature of an organism's body plan. And many developmental biologists still agree with that. And the, the evidence comes from lots of groups of animals, but the key group of organisms on which all the key research was done was the ciliates. That's our microscopic single-celled animals, and those of you who have ever done biology at school or university will at least have come across paramecium, the slipper animalcule. It's microscopic. Uh, or vorticella, or tetrahymena, or stentor. Uh, you know, those are some of the, probably the best known one ones. So if any of you have ever done biology at school or university, you will come across at least some of, some of those. And as you can see by looking at those pictures, they've got quite a complex cell surface structure. They're covered in tiny hairs for a start, cilia, which uh, moves them along. And these cilia you know, are in uh, patterns around the organism. That uh, bottom uh, left picture there just shows the rows of, of, of cilia. They've been stained to appear up. And the other picture just shows you the very complex structure of these organisms. So they've got quite a complex structure, and particularly the cell surface structure. And by the 1950s, it was proven beyond doubt that the ciliate cell surface structures and their patterns were inherited independently of genes and DNA. How was this done? Quite easily. You can just perform little surgical operations on these animals and, say, remove some structures or replace them, or alter them in some way, or carefully cut out a row of cilia and put it in backwards. You, you can do all sorts of um, really not very respectful things to these little organisms. And they would heal very quickly. And then that defect was just reproduced indefinitely. The next generation would be produced with exactly the same defect. Even though you could show genetically that the DNA, the genes, the genetics have not been changed one iota. It's exactly the same as before. And yet this structure was inherited indefinitely. Ah. Moreover, Jonathan Wells, in 2014, published a peer-reviewed paper in the journal Biocomplexity entitled Membrane Patterns Carry Ontogenetic Information that is specified independently of DNA. He has over 400 citations to the technical literature in the paper and shows that body plans depend on crucial sources of information that exist outside of DNA. From Dr. Wells' paper, we've, in regards to cortical inheritance, which Dr. Arthur Jones had talked about in this video, we find, indeed, ciliates with artificially inverted rows have been stably maintained for thousands of generations. That DNA is not the be-all, end-all, as envisioned in the, the modern synthesis of neo-Darwinism, is also made evident in this following if its naming had followed 
rather than preceded molecular analysis of its DNA, the extremophile bacterium radiodurans might have been called Lazarus. After shattering its 3.2 megabit genome into 20 to 30 kilobit pieces by dissection, dissection or a high dose of ionizing radiation, radiodurans miraculously reassembles its genome such that only three hours later fully reconstituted non-rearranged chromosomes are present and the cell carries on alive as normal. In the following paper it was shown that this was not an, uh, an anomaly of radiodurance. In this paper it was shown that E. coli could evolve to resist ionizing radiation by exposing cultures of the bacterium to highly radioactive isotope cobalt-60. We blasted the cultures until 99% of the bacteria were dead. Then we grow up the survivors and blast them again. We did that 20 times. The result were E. coli capable of enduring as much as four orders of magnitude more ionizing radiation, making them similar to radiodurans. Moreover, not only does DNA not control body plan morphogenesis, as Dr. Meyer termed it, but DNA does not even control its own spatial organization and shape in the body. In this article we find, we show that chromosomes exhibit tissue specific organization. Chromosomes are distributed tissue specifically with, with respect to their position relative to the center of the nucleus and also relative to each other. Subsets of chromosomes form distinct types of spatial clusters in different tissues and the relative distance between chromosome pairs varies among tissues. In this article, Dr. Jonathan Wells states, we now know that there is considerable variation in DNA sequences among tissues and even among cells in the same tissue. It's called genomic mosaicism. I now know as an embryologist, tissues and cells, as they differentiate, modify their DNA to suit their needs. It's the organism controlling the DNA, not the DNA controlling the organism. A friend told me this story on a blog I participated on. Last year I had a fair chunk of my nose removed in skin cancer surgery. The surgeon took flesh from a nearby area to fill in the hole he made. In the healing process, the replanted cells somehow knew how to take a different shape appropriate to for the new location so that the nose now looks remarkably natural. The doctor said he could only take half the credit because the cells somehow know how to change form for a different location. In this paper, Stephen Talbot writes, Harvard biologist Richard Lewontin once described how you can excise the developing limb bud from an amphibian embryo, shake the cells loose from each other, allow them to re-aggregate into a random lump, and then re replace the lump in the embryo. A normal leg develops. Somehow the form of the limb as a whole is the ruling factor, redefining the parts according to the larger pattern. Such an object is less like a machine than it is like a language whose elements take unique meaning from their context. DNA doesn't even tell us what shape the protein will take. Here's a telling omission from Francis Collins who led the Human Genome Project to sequence the human genome. We are so woefully ignorant about how biology really works. We still don't understand how a particular DNA sequence 
when we just stare at it, codes for a protein that has a particular function. We can't even figure out how that protein would fold into what kind of three-dimensional shape. And I would defy anybody who is going to tell me that they could, from first principles, predict not only the shape of the protein, but also what it does. Stuart A. Newman, professor of cell biology and anatomy, states, even with the same sequence, a given protein can have different shapes and functions. Furthermore, many proteins have no intrinsic shape, intrinsically disordered proteins, taking on different roles in different molecular contexts. So even though genes specify protein sequences, they have only a tenuous, very weak or slight influence over their functions. So, to reiterate, the genes do not uniquely determine what is in the cell, but what is in the cell determines how the genes get used. Only if the pie were to rise up, take hold of the recipe, and rewrite the instructions for its own production would this popular, popular analogy for the role of genes be pertinent. Moreover, protein folding is certainly not accomplished by a random process and it is unknown exactly how a protein finds its final folded form. This paper puts it like this. Put simply, the Leventhal paradox states that when one calculates the number of possible topological rotational configurations for the amino acids in even a small, say 100 residue, unfolded protein, random search could never find the final folded confirmation of that same protein during the lifetime of the physical universe. The challenge of the protein folding problem is to learn what those pathways are. The following paper showed that the protein folding problem is computationally hard in the same way that the traveling salesman problem is hard. Yet it is, it is exactly this type of traveling salesman problem that quantum computers excel at. In this article we find quantum computing is, in some cases, really, really fast says the calculations the D-Wave excels at involve a specific combinatorial optimization problem comparable in difficulty to the more famous traveling salesperson problem that has been a foundation of theoretical computing for decades. That proteins have the inherent ability to perform quantum computation and thus provide an adequate solution to the protein folding enigma is established by the fact that proteins are now found to have quantum information embedded within them. In this paper we find that this indicates that peptide plane from the energy viewpoint possesses synergetic classical quantum properties. Consideration of peptide planes and protein chain from information viewpoint also shows that protein chain possesses classical and quantum properties. This paper entitled Physicists Discovered Quantum Law of Protein Folding also backs up the claim that protein folding is a quantum process, not a classical process. In the paper it is stated if this process were a quantum one, the shape could change by quantum transition, meaning that the protein could jump from one shape to another without necessarily forming the shapes in between. And they even go so, so far as to say that's the equivalent in biology to something like the thermodynamic laws in physics. Finding quantum 
entanglement and quantum computation to be involved in proteins and in protein folding is is uh, completely uh, a antithetical to Darwinian concerns because it's not it's simply not compatible with the materialistic presuppositions of neo-Darwinian evolution. This paper puts it like this. Our result gives weight to the idea that quantum correlations somehow, somehow arise from outside space-time in the sense that no story and space and time can describe them. There are a few more references I could have referenced along this quantum line of thought, but I left them out for the sake of brevity. But suffice it to say, whereas Darwinists don't have a beyond space and time cause to appeal to in order to explain how protein folding is accomplished by quantum processes, I do have a beyond space and time cause to appeal to to explain how the protein achieves its final form and how I myself achieve my final form. And that's the end of the video. Thanks very much for watching.